So, my dear friends, are you once again ready to join the organization that takes care of everything paranormal? Here we are in episode four of this epic series. Now, it has taken me quite a while to get back to this, but it will be coming back in full force over the next few weeks. Abram Stalker 1789, the author, has promised me ten parts in total, and here we are just on part four. Unlike some of the series I do, this one does really require you to listen to every episode in order, so if you've missed the first three parts, they are listed in the video description, so make sure you listen to them first and return to this after. Well, my dear friends, it's time, once again, to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. You know, there's something to be said for a clear fang. Sometimes, it just works. A lot of the time, it just flows with the story, so... Sorry, not sorry. I just have to deal with it. I opened my eyes again to the sight and feeling of the Rusalka, her translucent blue form laying on my chest. She spoke, eyes closed and body unmoving. You are still sleeping. I breathed a sigh of relief and concern. Again, she spoke to me this time rising from her position to face me, eyes half open and drowsy. I will not hold you for more than half an hour. You have important business, I understand. I looked back over my shoulder, trying to see the village. In my head, I wondered, what the fuck are we going to do about that? It became apparent to me that, at that moment, she could read my thoughts when we were in this state. After she responded, Must you be so profane? I sighed aloud, then began to stare down at the snow in front of me. I spoke aloud, curiously pondering. It all seems so real. How is this possible? She responded quietly. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. This has never happened before. My brow furrowed at this response, and then one raised while the other encroached further on my eye, as I began to ask a question of her. Do you understand English? Wait, don't answer that. We've been speaking in English, haven't we? At this, her mouth grew into a smile, and then wider as her body rocked in an apparent fit of laughter. Guess that answers my question, I replied to her laughter. It seemed, however, that she suddenly grew solemn. Her face fell into a neutral position, and her body fell into a tense sort of relaxation. She spoke to me, voice monotone and carrying an undertone of sadness. Our time is coming to an end. I cannot stretch this moment any longer. She began to draw away from me, while I wrapped my arms around her. It had been an eternity since I'd felt this kind of connection with someone. She shared her trauma with me, and I with her. She had no words of pity for me. She did not view me as broken, perhaps as nearly everyone else that I knew did. I did not want this moment to end. I decided right then, with the feeling of her body against mine, that I would not let it end. She was the only person who truly understood what I had been through, although I'm not sure how. I felt her head dig into my chest, a clear sign that she felt the same way. I felt her hands move out from their protective embrace around her chest, and two things after that. One was the softness of her bosom pressed against me. The second was her hands, slowly tracing a path to my head. I released a little bit of pressure on her, and she slid upwards in my arms, with her hands carefully taking hold of my head. Her face was soon just centimetres from me, and her eyes stared directly into mine. She spoke as she drew closer, her voice falling into a whisper as she said my name. Perhaps, John, there is a way. Our eyes closed as we slowly drifted closer to each other. I felt her lips touch mine, and yet again something inexplicable happened. Our lips pressed together, and I felt what was cold and distant become warm and real. Through my closed eyelids, I saw an intense light suddenly explode from our points of contact. 
I slowly opened my eyes, and in front of me was the Rizalka, her body now flesh and blood. She drew back from me, her long light blonde hair now falling against me, and her fair light skin glowing a slight golden color. Drawing back far enough to speak, she said, Now we can be together for as long as you like. The only thing I ask in return is that when you tire of my presence, return me to my stream here. I had my doubts about it at this point, but this would be the start of something much greater than either of us could imagine. I stated in no uncertain terms, The only things I will ask of you are your loyalty and your name. She responded, smiling as she said it, And those are two things I can give you. My name is Svetlana Gennadyevna Belinsky, but you can call me Lana. She smiled at me, and then laid her head back on my chest, and spoke for the last time in my dreamlike state. Every night I will manifest in your dreams. We can see each other then. However, I will join you in battle as an assistant. Think of me as an extra head to use when thinking. It is time for you to awake. You must go now. I responded to all of this with a mere grunt of acknowledgement and the tightening of our embrace, pressing our bodies together. I blinked, and I was sitting against the log, Gabe shaking me awake. He hissed through his clenched teeth. Oh, wake the fuck up, man. What the fuck took you so long? I raised my wrist, looking at my watch. It was only 8.30. She was right on the money, I thought to myself. And then, somewhat startlingly, I heard her voice in my head. I have to admit, I jumped a little at the mental sound of it. She said confidently, Of course I was. Oh, sorry, I startled you. And I said aloud, not realizing it, Yeah, well, it's okay. I caught Gabe staring at me like I was insane, just out of the corner of my eye, which, given the circumstances, would really be understandable. He slowly opened his mouth to speak, but I turned to him and cut him off. Look, I'll explain it all later, including why we got knocked out, but right now we need to get moving. It's almost light out. He slowly shut his mouth tightly and pointed his finger at me as he stood up. Fine, but you better have a damn good explanation. Gabe turned his head to look upon the village, and as soon as his eyes reached it, his shoulders fell and he sighed in relief. Damn birds are gone. In my head, I questioned Svetlana. Any of your work? She responded quickly. Yet, but we should exploit it before the opportunity passes. Those things have to feed once a day, and we do not want to be around them when they are hungry. My brow furrowed at the thought. I don't think anybody would at the thought of being eaten by a pack of hungry birds. I turned to Gabe, speaking frankly. We need to get in while we can. He nodded his head in agreement, and responded with his own statement. You take point. My knees are killing me. Before we left, we hastily switched our gear out, and gone again were the jackets and heavier winter gear mid-layers, the tactical shirts and vests making a return to visible surface. I could feel the cold sapping away at my warmth through the soft layers that now face the elements, but the underlayers we both wore would protect us well enough from the cold. As we made arrangements, I heard a familiar female voice enter my head, but not with the usual happiness. John, I've been meaning to ask you, but I'm afraid to do so because of the answer I may get. I responded quickly, not giving that statement any time to stew in my head. None was needed. Ask me anything, and don't be afraid. If something causes problems between us, then fate has had it that way. She also responded, just as quickly, voice apologetic in tone. No, no, that is not what I meant at all. It is not involving you. I simply want to know what the year is. I took a moment to think after securing the velcro of my vest, and, of course, since she knew all of them, 
she knew instantly. Oh, so that's how it is. <laughs> you know, I was hoping there was a chance I could see them again. But likely by now, they've all been forgotten. I pulled a warm balaclava over my head, shielding my ears and nose from the biting cold, its synthetic fibers smooth against my skin, although it did catch against the unshaven mess that was beginning to grow on my face. Soon after... Goggles and a high-density polyethylene, or HDPE, and a Kevlar helmet were pulled over my head. Then, finally, I threw a heavy woolen scarf around my neck. I looked at Gabe, who was also putting the finishing touches on his kit, minus the Specs visor. The batteries were low enough after being on for the entire ride over, and we decided that we knew enough about the village to forego them. Not to mention, it was nearly light out. About thirty minutes more, and we would be basking in the glory of a full, cloud-covered Siberian sun. I grabbed my rifle, and so did Gabe. We left our rucks behind that log. Perhaps not the best thing to have done, but taking them with us would have meant a lot more weight. And in combat, that's not something we could afford to do. However, I did take with me one thing in particular. The radio. Smart move on my part. One thing worried me, however. On the horizon, we saw a series of lights flashing in the waning darkness. Although it couldn't be told exactly what the cause was, a good guess could be made as to what those lights themselves were. Explosions. Gabe noticed me staring, and his gaze soon also laid upon the horizon. They were constant, but not consistent. We both looked at each other. And that said enough. Soon we departed from the relative safety of the tree, and slowly we made our way closer to the village, leapfrogging from cover to cover, all the while staying as hidden as possible. We reached the stretch of empty ground that was the final barrier to the village. During the whole time, Alana laid silent. Although I'm sure she was thinking, she sure wasn't saying anything. You may think it would have been a good idea to either sprint or crawl across the empty space in front of us. However, neither are really what you want to be doing. Take the middle ground and walk. Slowly but carefully, we made our way to the village without disturbing anything along the way. By this time, the light filtering through the clouds was more than enough to light our way. We crept past the burned homes and avoided oddly pitted patches of the death ice. The town, however, was still inhabited by creatures. Among the shattered homes were many creatures, ranging from bears of the caliber we had faced before to something around the size of a wolverine. However, both the lumbering beasts and their more nimble counterparts slumbered on. Then, as we rounded a corner and made our way into the small square that formed the central hub of the village, we saw our MTLB. It had sat there untouched the entire time we'd been gone. Now it was nestled among snowbanks, the top carrying a powdery coating of its own. We crept up to its back doors, which, thankfully, were still sealed shut. I stopped at the side of the door, and Gabe moved ahead of me to the other side. In the deep snow, just over our knees, we'd made trails that could be traced all the way back to our covering position in the forest. The snow piled up against the doors, and was an obstacle that took a few minutes to clear. Near the top, all we had to do was use our gloves to scoop it up out of the way, but it was much more compacted near the bottom. We managed to get the doors clear, and after a short break to get our gloves surface dry, and give our arms a break, I put my Dragunov on my back with its sling, and drew my primary pistol. An absolutely beautiful 10mm Glock. The perfect balance between the penetration of a 9mm and the stopping power of a 45 caliber. I own four, all with different camouflage patterns. This one has a white and black frame with a matte white slide, and on top of all that, sporting a small red dot optic. For most of the mission, it had laid buried in a side pocket of my pack, along with a few extra magazines of ammunition. 
but now I had it in a thigh holster, ready to go. My fingers stayed carefully away from the flashlight, slung on a rail in front of the trigger guard. Gabe moved across the way, taking up a position beside me as I lined up my sight with the crack of the door. He then placed his hand on the door's handle, carefully beginning to push inwards and turn it. I'm not sure if it was always this way, or if the cold had simply caused the metal to shrink, but the handle made an awful grinding sound. Gabe immediately stopped and looked at me, head shaking in an, of course this would happen, motion. I responded by my own patient but likewise irritated head roll, motioning with my occupied hands to open the door. He did so, and although the sound was horrendous, the door began to crack open, with the hinges creaking out the same awfully loud noise as before. I could finally see inside, and as far as I could see, it was clear. Once there was enough space to squeeze through, I propelled myself into the open door, bringing my pistol to bear against whatever might lay in wait around the corner. Thankfully, the contents of the troop compartment gave me no motivation to fire. On the benches in front of me sat the two RPG-18s we'd left in the vehicle, along with the stands and logistical equipment for the sensors. Everything we'd left behind from earlier was still there. Not that we ended up needing it. Everything happened so fast that our information-gathering phase got cut rather short. That was probably a good time to make up for it, but we were soon much too busy to care. I carefully stepped on the metal floor, making my way across the tiny troop compartment to the access crawl space to the crew compartment on the right. I seamlessly transitioned to my hands and knees, my soft but firm foam knee pads cushioning me against the bare metal. Gabe pushed in behind me, back to mine, covering the door. I finally crossed around the corner, the two, thankfully empty, crew seats becoming visible. I turned back to him, throwing a thumbs up with my left hand as my right slipped my pistol back into its holster. He grabbed the door, shutting it as quietly as possible given the circumstances, slowly cutting off the daylight that lit the troop compartment. We convened in the crawl space, sitting next to the engine, deciding what to do next. I pulled down my scarf and balaclava and put my goggles to rest on my forehead. Gabe did the same. I leaned into his ear, speaking in the lowest, yet still audible voice I could muster. It's all just like we left it. I drew back and he nodded in agreement. I looked back at the engine and realized something vital, something we and the Russians who had given us this damn thing had overlooked previously, that would now come to bite us in the ass. Hosed is a specific term to use when describing getting screwed over in the military, and we certainly got hosed. I leaned into Gabe's ear again, carefully whispering my question. Remind me, at what temperature does diesel start to turn into fucking wax? He looked at me, then the engine. The realization filled out his face and he motioned with his hands for me to move out of the way as he frantically shuffled towards the engine. I slid on my back out of his way as he opened up the thin steel panels. The look on his face, after scouring the engine for a few moments, drooped. He fell backwards, nearly slamming into the wall on the other side of the narrow space. He looked up, as if he was looking at God, and muttered something that I didn't really hear, and from the syllables used, that was probably a good thing. I took this as a sign that, no, the engine did not have a heat, and yes, everything was as good as frozen. I will admit, at this, I let out a depressed sigh. However, I didn't let myself sit on this for very long. My attention and my head turned towards the radios in the front of the vehicle. Hopefully... The battery wasn't too frozen to power the long-range radio. I was going to find out. I reached over and flicked on the switch, just to see if it worked. Nothing happened. 
Now, this might seem like a bit of a problem, but you have to understand something about radios in armoured vehicles. They don't have speakers. At least, not like speakers on a boombox. The audio inputs and outputs are all handled through a headset, like you might have to do with a computer monitor lacking speakers. Thankfully, I had something that would work just well enough. The radio that I brought along with me. Although, I cannot disclose to you its exact model and the company who produces it, for security reasons of course. We have radios that are just a little special. Over the many years of working with different nations, everyone from the US to China, on occasion our guys put in a research and development R&D request for a radio that has audio passed through to all of the radios that were produced commercially at the time. Hence the one we now have, and the one I had then, with its special retractable cable spool that fits inside of a panel on the left bottom. I pried open the small hinge panel and dragged out the delicate end of the device. The apparatus, which some would say looks like a squid, splits off into multiple smaller cables at one point. They are colour-coded, and you have to be trained to use them, or else you might end up doing something stupid and ruining the radio you're trying to connect to. Each individual tentacle is graduated like a step drill bit, but stretched out, with several ridges of decreasing size narrowing down to a blunt tip about one and a half millimetres wide. I slotted in the necessary wires and waited for a moment. The radio has to do a small amount of diagnostic and analytical work before it can connect, just to determine what radio it is actually interfacing with. Most nations, for operational security reasons, use different frequencies for their own proprietary radios, and using one with the other will not work, at least not correctly. Once the internals had a moment to activate, a promising static emanated from the radio. It crackled and popped like an old electronic bowl of a certain breakfast cereal. I decided to try contacting base on local emergency frequencies, as it was the most likely way to get a direct response. After all, we were in somewhat of an emergency. I sent my voice out over the airwaves, the press of a button on my handset. This is Copperhead Actual. We need immediate extraction. I repeat, this is Copperhead Actual. We're surrounded and in need of immediate extraction. After my voice fell out, I waited for a few moments before trying again. This is Copperhead Actual. We are surrounded and we need immediate extraction. I repeat. However, my voice was interrupted mid-sentence by a voice over the radio. A Russian radio operator, most likely from the very base we'd left from. It was slightly garbled, but the volume was such that this was not a problem. In fact, it was a little too loud. I jumped to turn the volume down so it wouldn't be heard across the village. However, I had no idea that this was irrelevant. The voice said, Copperhead 2, we read. However, we have no free aircraft at the time. They are all engaged fighting the Medved Imali. He paused for a moment as if talking to someone off the microphone, then finished. Copperhead, hold for General Smirnov. Gabe leaned intently over my shoulder, and at the mention of Medvedi Melny, his brow furrowed along with mine, as we looked at each other, puzzled. He said it first, slowly, questioning. Bears, lightning, what the hell? I responded slowly, my head turning towards the viewports as I did. Yeah, bears of lightning, Gabe. What color is the lightning? He was confused even more at this question, although once he spoke, his understanding grew by the letter. Lightning is blue. Why, no, no way. I slowly opened the metal covering projecting the glass viewport from the outside. Snow falling off as I did so. Meters away from the APC, a bear was stirring. Its bare skin dark grey, the snow around it covered in shed brown fur. As we watched it rise from the ground to face us, a slight ripple of electricity emanated from its head, 
flowing out over its body. It looked directly at us, directly at me. The thing is, I felt nothing, not even a twinge of soul. Just the motivation of a machine, taking orders from something far away. This must be the feeling that hapless Afghan insurgents feel when a predator drone flies over them, just watching. Now, I won't lie to you, this scared the shit out of me. The first thing I said was a slow, drawn-out, fuck, and my hand holding the radio slowly rose up to my face, and I calmly spoke into the receiver as my hand shook a little. This is Carpet Actual. If we don't get extract immediately, we are fucked. This time a different voice came over the radio. It was General Smirnov, and his gruff, Soviet vintage Russian accent. Comrade, hear this. Lieutenant Petrenko and his squad are the only ones crazy enough to get you out of there. In five minutes, a flight of attack jets will overfly and provide close air support. Lieutenant Petrenko will be two minutes behind them with a helicopter. Mark your position with smoke. In the background I could hear various muffled explosions touching off. I quickly responded, Spasiba, General. I waited for his response, but instead I received a response from the operator. The General has already left. Good luck, Amerikanski. Then the transmission ended. Static once more filled the crew cabin, and I glanced at the armoured glass, looking through to the approaching bears and other animals outside. Still staring out at them, I said to Gabe, Are you ready? He pressed a smoke grenade into my hand, saying, I was born ready. Let's do this. We shuffled through the crawl space as fast as we could, and upon reaching the crew compartment, both of us drew our weapons. We each slung an RPG on our shoulders, and as the timer ticked down, we could hear them coming closer. Two minutes. The slow, marching, heavy crunch of the bears was the most distinct, but the faster footsteps were what worried me. We might be able to handle a couple of the large ones. Certainly the deer were susceptible to rifle rounds, but the smaller ones might be too agile to hit. Either way, there were only seconds left. My body was nearly shaking in anticipation. Adrenaline is another thing you never really get used to. It gets less noticeable and more controllable, but it is certainly a biological, uncontrollable process. For the first time in a while, I heard the voice of Lana. Please, don't die. I said nothing and merely nodded my head in acknowledgement. I was much too pumped to speak. I heard them in the distance. Inside of the steel of the APC, it was difficult to make them out, but possible. In my head, I thought, it's time. Gabe nodded to me, and I pulled the pin on the smoke canister. He opened the door in a single motion, and I tossed the smoke out before slamming it shut. The low whine grew to a howl, and as the smoke spread around our APC, someone up there was watching. I knew it was a pier, from the way they passed over in tandem. Normal procedure dictates that one stays higher up to cover the air, while the other makes an attack. But this was no normal situation. From inside the APC, we listened as they both flew over, making a pass to establish visual contact. My personal radio erupted into life. The lead pilot saying, Cobblehead, this is Colonel Rasenii. Pleasure to meet you again. We will obliterate the target area with our next pass. You are inside the tank down there. I replied as quickly as I could, while still speaking rationally. Yes, we are. He then calmly replied, Well, don't worry about it. You are speaking to the MCH's best SU-25 pilot. We'll slice a line open for you straight to the edge of the village for Petrenko to pick you up. I shouted one last word as I heard the engines begin to grow again in the distance. Spasibo, Polkovnik. Or, oh, thank you, Colonel. 
Seconds later, the aircraft's GSH-32 dual guns fired. 30 millimeter rounds blew their way through any resisting creature and instantly caused them to explode. A mixture of high explosive and armor piercing made sure that even the smallest of targets would be made into an electronic hamburger. We heard the first jet slicing through the air above us, but the area wasn't clear enough because the second pass that came through ripped apart the ground so much that when we slammed the doors open seconds later, there was mud everywhere. As soon as we were out of the vehicle, we burst into a dead sprint for the edge of the village. In front of us, a bear was lumbering forward, straight into our path. In response, I screamed, Not this time, motherfucker as I slid through the mud and snow to a knee, swinging the RPG around from my back and, in one motion, sliding out the tube with my index fingers, priming it to fire. I lined up the sights and pressed the button. A click, then a deafening explosion as the propellant charge blasted the missile out of the tube, barely giving the rocket time to ignite before it slammed into the bed. Detonating almost immediately, and throwing it into a massive, swirling cloud of blue, green, orange, and red. Gabe stopped sprinting, aiming down sights and firing two round bursts at 1,800 rounds per minute with his AN-94 until I passed him. He then turned on a dime and sprinted along with me through the newly cleared ground. It was when we reached the edge of the village that I heard the rotor blades chopping through the air above us, and seconds later saw the helicopter, an MI-8, AMTSH, shoot out from over the trees. The heli was flaring hard, burning off all of its 200 plus kilometers per hour of speed in about a hundred meters. Takes a damn good pilot to do that. And what he did next was nothing short of astonishing. This particular MI-8 had a set of two gun pods on the outside that contained two dual GSH-23 guns, set up just like the SU-25. They work on the GAST principle, where each gun's recoil operates the other's firing mechanism. He lowered the nose of the heli, lined up with the enemies behind us, and used the recoil of the guns to slow the helicopter to a hover over our position. The rear ramp opened as it lowered and came to a hover just above the ground. I saw Petrenko almost leaning out, trying to yell something through the rotor wash. And then something blindsided me, hitting me like a freight train. Sorry, not something physical, but something mental. I was back in that moment, all those years ago. Bob was there. My sister was holding my hand. My thoughts narrowed down, and my mouth got so dry that I almost choked. It felt like I was going to puke and suffocate all at the same time. I was sucking air. My stomach was tightening as I suffered through the flashbacks. At that point, it was the first time in six years that I'd been hit that hard by it. PTSD ain't an easy case, and I don't claim that my work makes it any easier. But it's my choice. Then, in my chamber of darkness, a light appeared, making it more of a tunnel. My vision started to come back. I heard her voice through the fog. She was frantically screaming my name. John! 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 I blinked hard, screamed an expletive, loaded with the emotional pain of everything that had happened back then, and slammed my foot into the ground, digging it in and propelling myself forwards. Right where my head had been moments ago, I felt a brush of wind. It seemed weird to me then. Gabe was running from the chopper towards me, and in a similar fashion to me earlier, I saw him slam into the ground next to my feet. But he went prone. As my feet pushed myself past him, I watched the back blast rip through the air in front of me, throwing snow and ice at the helicopter's lowered ramp. From the heli, the one exposed door gunner was firing continuously, and the barrel of his KPVT 14.5mm heavy machine gun was glowing red. I could see her with her blue-green form glowing just like it did the first time I'd seen her. She was my light. She was standing at the back of the helicopter, waiting for me. 
All I had to do was get there. Time dilated harder than it ever had done before. My footsteps seemed to take an eternity to hit the ground. In the helicopter, men were now raising their rifles at what must have been chasing us. Whether I knew it or not, Gabe was right behind me. The heli started to lift off, growing even farther from the ground, and as I stepped up onto the ramp, bullets whizzing past my head towards the threats, I felt a hand grab my shoulder, nearly throwing me into the chopper. It was Petrenko, and as I rolled mid-air onto my back, I saw him grab Gabe's hand, just as he got swiped in the thighs by a huge bear. His blood flew outwards in little droplets from the wounds, caught in the rotor wash along with torn clothing. And then time got faster, faster than normal. Gabe was pulled into the helicopter, and the crew set upon him immediately. Tourniquets were pulled on his legs, inches above the wounds. They were gruesome, practically gushing blood from his severed arteries. However, he was still very much conscious. He was looking at me. His eyes seemed to ask me, Why? I stared back, not knowing what to do. Why? he asked. Is life so unfair? Why do we live like this? And Gabe, to tell you the truth, I still don't know. I may never know. Hopefully you can find out. Hopefully you find the answer. Because you sure as hell didn't find it out there. hope you're enjoying this series. Um, it's taken me a while to get back to this one, like I said, but it's definitely worth it as far as I'm concerned, and I will be doing the other episodes in the next few weeks. So, thoughts, feelings, response to this video in the comment section, and of course I will join in the chat as and when I can. But well, that's enough for one week, isn't it? You're going to come back and join me again next week, aren't you, though? Of course you are. Until then, have a fantastic weekend, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>